Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Annalisa and this is going to be my April wrap up which means anything that I didn't talk about in my first half wrap up or my vlog that I did last week I'm going to be talking about this today. And I'm experimenting with this scrunchie as a stim toy because during my vlog last week I had one of these in my hand for at least one of the clips and was playing with it and I enjoyed that. Um, so let's start with my last few reads for the Disability Readathon. Um, these didn't fill any particular prompts, um, but I just found them uh, in my library's catalog of audiobooks. Um, and I had to do quite a bit of searching and found a lot of duds that were not own voices before I found some that were. Um, but both of these authors had in their either bios or somewhere on their website that uh, these books were semi-autobiographical because they had the disability that they were talking about. They're both middle grade too, which I enjoy. So first is Paperboy by Vince Vauter. And this is a very sweet story. Very nostalgic feeling set in the 60s. Um, but also just because it's set in a little suburb type neighborhood and our main character is a paper boy so um he isn't usually he's taking over a friend's route um partially because he feels responsible for um his friend getting injured a few months ago in a sports incident um so he's taking over a route while this kid goes off to his grandparents farm for a month of the summer so he uh has a stutter it's pretty difficult for him to talk. He has a speech therapist and he's got some strategies so like he uses I think it's called soft air to kind of um, help the words come out and it was very interesting because I didn't know much about stutters before this. I had seen like the King's Speech and stuff but it um as it's a movie you don't necessarily get to see his inner thoughts of like how he's um what it feels like from the inside to have this difficulty speaking. So we get to see a lot inside this um, kid's mind and like how he chooses different words um, to make up a sentence uh, so that he can get his meaning across without having to have any particularly difficult letters or having any alliteration because that makes it more difficult. So like he especially struggles with I think P's and V's um, and G's and a few others and so like um, if a word starts with that sound it is especially hard to say the whole word so sometimes he'll just switch out the first letter um, and other times he'll switch out the whole word and it was very interesting that there were various psychological tricks that he could do um, to be able to get words out so it's more of a some kind of interaction between the brain and the nervous system and the muscles um, of the tongue and throat where if he like distracts himself by throwing a pencil um, that can help him get a word out as he does it or he can sing the words um, or if he's like swinging on a porch swing he can like time his words to go with when he pushes off and that like helps him get the words out so that was really interesting to see and it was a fair amount about how his world expanded when he took on this paper route um, because he sees all these different people in his neighborhood and a few of them he forms particular relationships with. There's also the relationship that he has with his live-in um, housekeeper. This is a white family with a black housekeeper and there was a little bit about how she was his best friend outside of the boy that he was covering the paper out for and um, they like go to the zoo together and um, she can ride in the front of the bus if she's with him. Um, so yeah, talked about some of those things. It was a very cozy, it made me feel a lot of things, mostly positive emotions. And at the end, the author came on, spoke on the audiobook to talk about um, support for people with stutters and the science that has come out about it and um, how much speech therapy has evolved since he was a kid. Um, and that was really interesting. That was really interesting to hear him talk um, because the narrator talked in his normal voice for most of the book um, except for the dialogue where the main character was speaking. Then he did the kind of soft air and 
um, kind of showed the difficult way it was to talk. And so hearing the author's actual stutter as it is now when he's, maybe he's like 60 to 70 years old, um, that was really interesting because um, you could heal, still hear it to an extent, but he's had enough speech therapy and like strategies and stuff that it's not as severe as when he was a kid. There's a famous actor comedian who sounds very similar to how he sounds now, and I can't remember his name, but I've only seen him play really sweet characters, so <laughs> I really like him. But yeah, it's apparently mostly hereditary. So yeah, I really, really like that one. Uh, then we have O.C. Daniel, which is on the cover. You can see it's like the letters are lined up, so it's like O.C.D. and the, the D is the beginning of Daniel. Um, because this main character has OCD and um, so does the author. This was about um, a time when Daniel um, makes a new friend with someone who is also neurodivergent. They don't have the word that word and also he doesn't even know that he has OCD at the beginning of the book um, which is particularly upsetting um, for him and correspondingly for me because it's uh, um, similar to when I read books where at the beginning the character doesn't know they're autistic. They're different but they don't know why and like all of the symptoms are really upsetting and all the symptoms and traits are really upsetting because you don't know what's causing them and you think you're um, there's something wrong with you. I've learned more about OCD lately and I learned a lot about it through this book but it is very anxiety based. The compulsions for example are a way to um, lessen the anxiety or deal with the anxiety. I have anxiety and meds help it uh, somewhat, kind of take it from really really bad to just bad. So I don't know if that's how it would act with OCD people or like how exactly the chemistry of it works. Um, because a lot of OCD is just treated with CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is where you rearrange your thoughts to um, convince your brain that your anxiety is irrational and that it doesn't need to be anxious. Um, and I have mixed feelings about CBT because for autistic people um, and for anyone who is marginalized basically in a lot of ways it's not very helpful because it doesn't account for the fact that life might actually be bad because um, it's all about convincing you that you're things you're anxious about are irrational. So if you have rational fears, like the fear of social rejection that autistic people have um, when they get repeatedly rejected and they're not going to stop being rejected because neurotypical people reject autistic people, it's not an irrational fear so CBT can't help with it. Um, and a lot of therapists are not equipped to help in other ways because CBT is one of the few therapies that insurance will pay for so it's one of the few therapies that therapists are even allowed to use because their clients can't pay for anything else. Um, so it's a real complicated um, thing. But also like if you're poor and you're anxious about being poor and you go to CBT therapy, they're not going to be able to convince you that you shouldn't be anxious about being poor because there's real stuff to be anxious about there about making sure you have a roof over your head and food and stuff. So yeah, it has limited uses and it's applied way too widely, but I've heard from people um, with OCD that it's been very helpful for them. We don't get into that type of thing in this book. Um, we just get into what it's like to actually have it um, because the kid um, doesn't know he has it for most of the time. So um, particular ways it manifests for him are he has a long nighttime routine and he feels like if he doesn't complete that routine correctly, i.e. in a way that eases his anxiety, he thinks that he will not wake up. Um, and so sometimes he has to go through it for several hours before he can feel like he's done it correctly, taken the right number of steps, washed his hands, the right number of um, scrubs like this, used the towel correctly, flipped the light off the right number of times. Um, he has to keep doing it over and over till the anxiety eases because otherwise he won't be able to sleep. Um, but those things also come up at school. So like he um, has to tap his pencil a certain number of times or he feels like something bad will happen. 
um, to an overwhelming extent. But the part of his life that it focuses on is when he meets and starts spending time with another neurodivergent girl who um, has schizophrenia and um, anxiety and depression. And she makes him feel a lot less alone, um, unsurprisingly. And there's a girl he likes at school who isn't the neurodivergent one, so it, there's a lot about how um, awkward having a crush is. And something I like that this book did is that she is popular and pretty and girly and feminine, but she is not a mean girl. She's actually really kind. Um, so that was nice to see. Then let's go with P.S. I Miss You by Jan Petro Roy. This I got from a recommendation video of um, Anya's favorite um, queer middle grade. I requested a bunch of different books from those videos for Pride Month since that's only a couple of my months away. Um, but this one was immediately available so I got as an audiobook. Um, and it is about a young um, girl who is gradually figuring out that she likes girls. Um, whose sister has gone away, been sent away, uh, by her parents for being pregnant as a teenager. Um, and, uh, it's a Catholic family, and pretty much the entire town is Catholic. Um, a few of them are other brands of Christian, but there's very few non-Christians in this town. And so, it's very secret why she's gone away. And so it spans from the summer through to, I think, about Christmas time. After she spent the summer um, in the last phases of her pregnancy and having the baby, the, her, the parents of both girls tell the younger girl that she has gone off to another, uh, a Catholic school in another town so that she won't have to um, deal with possibly anyone finding out about the baby or, um, and also to separate her from her boyfriend who is still in town. The fact that he has sex is not visible so no one knows about it. And if they did, they wouldn't care that much because he's a guy. Fortunately, um, I actually really liked the boyfriend character. He was a good guy. It wasn't his fault that sexism meant that everyone was ashamed of her, but not him. So yeah, there's a lot of shame culture in this book. So if you would have trouble with that, I recommend not reading it. But if you're in a place where you kind of want to process that kind of stuff, or um, you're not from that kind of background, um, and want to kind of see what it's like, um, the parents and kind of the whole town are pretty homophobic. So the main character figuring out she's a lesbian is difficult for her and scary. Um, but yeah, she starts having feelings for this girl at school. She's in middle school. Middle school. Yeah, it's really precious. It's epistolary, so it's told um, in this girl's letters to her absent sister. And I saw the end coming for this one, too, a long time before it happened. So I was, like, bracing for the really sad impact the whole time. Then The Princess in Black and The Mermaid Princess. Um, which is by Shannon Hale and I think Dean Hale and I got it because of the cover and the um, author. I really like a lot of Shannon, Shannon Hale's middle grade. So this is a uh, younger middle grade and um, is part of a series uh, where the princess in black and oh what's the other one called? There's another princess and a boy who has also like a super hero name um, who like do a bunch of fun magical questy things together and they were on a boat in this one and happened to find a mermaid who told them that she was having trouble with her kingdom because it was being invaded and uh, they decided to go underwater and help her sort it out what should be done and like the moral was like that you should speak up for people when people are doing something wrong and it's not always more important to be nice to everyone um, if that means you let people be mean to other people and you're just nice to the people who are being mean. Um, so that was cool and very cute. And then we have some romances. So What If Me and You by Ronnie Lauren. I found this in um, my library's disability catalog too. It was an ebook. Um, but it's not own voices. 
so I'm just counting this romance and I loved it a lot it was so sweet um, one main character has anxiety specifically um, PTSD caused and one has an amputated leg and um, PTSD from the incident that caused it which was he was a firefighter and was in a house that um, partially collapsed on him so they are neighbors the first line of the book is she thinks her um, neighbor is a werewolf and like that attracted me um, because I like werewolf stories but I also like the whole grumpy on the outside mushy on the inside <laughs> storyline that some werewolf stories tend to have um so i was hoping it would be one of those and it was um but yeah she thinks that because he's up at night a lot he's big and burly and um he's he doesn't talk much and then one night she's screaming at a horror movie because she is a podcast author who reviews and dissects horror movies um, as well as um, authoring her own horror fiction um, and so he runs over with his um, hero firefighter instincts and bangs on the door and, and is like gonna save her from whoever's making her scream and she opens the door with pepper spray and so they have a little conversation and then um, they run into each other a few days later and uh, it all goes from there and yeah it was a lot about feeling out and being careful of each other's PTSD and working through their hurts from past relationships and trying to form this new one. He is someone who really likes to cook. He was the cook for his firehouse and so he teaches her to cook and she teaches him to appreciate horror movies and it was just so precious and sweet. I don't reread books right after I've read them very often unless I really, really like them. And this is one of those books that I reread immediately because I wanted to feel those feelings again. Okay, then we have three romances in the Christina C. Jones series, Serendipitous Love. Um, so first was Fall in Love Again, which I had to um, DNF at like 60% because that's when we found out it was a second chance romance. And that's when we found out what the hero did to make the heroine so angry that she held a grudge for like five years and married the rebound guy that she got with right after breaking up with him. I really like that whole setup, like she's moving back into town to get away from her husband who has committed crimes and is now in um, jail and um, she's wanting a fresh start but is coming back to where her ex but also all her friends and family live. Um, that part was cool but it turned out the problem with second chance romances a lot is that sometimes just circumstances pull them apart and like they move to different cities for reasons and that's usually fine um for me but oftentimes they broke up for a reason um or didn't get together for a reason and either the reason is too big of a deal for me to forgive the person who did the thing or it's a small deal and the other person has been petty this whole time and i don't really care for pity petty characters um, who are standing in their own way and being jerks to people for not very big offenses. And that's what it turned out to be with this one. So I couldn't really ship the romance after that, so I put it down. Now this one, The Way Love Goes, I kept on with the series because I had really liked the first two. Um, this one, number four, I really liked again, which I kind of predicted I would because of the nails and the wood on the cover. I thought it maybe had like a handyman character. Um, and in this case, it was a contractor, so it fulfilled what I wanted, um, who is working to rebuild both the um, a nearby restaurant and this is all in the same, all of these books take place in the same uh, area of, I don't even remember what city, but it's an area with a bunch of black owned businesses. And so he's fixing up one of the black owned restaurants down the block and he's also fixing up the heroine's uh, new house that she's bought. She is the owner of a lingerie store in the block of black businesses. This one was one of the shorter ones. It's 180 pages, whereas um, that other one was like 230. These two are both moving past bad breakups, both with the other when the other person had cheated on them. So hangups from that get in their way a little bit. Um, but it's mostly just a really enjoyable ride. And then this one is an extra short one. It's only... 
150 pages. Um, but it is also a check and sense romance, but this is one where pretty much it's a circumstances thing. They were broken up by her dad, who uh, she was the only child of, and he was the, um, kind of adopted child of and her dad was a sexist so he was going to pass his business on to this man instead of his daughter and so she got very angry about that and moved away to New York so um they were more taken apart by circumstances than anything else and um fix their own relationship issues pretty quickly um once she comes back to town so then it's just about them like navigating her dad being weird and figuring out how to um make the business better together since she's come back to town even though she's going to work for a different restaurant um she still wants to help out her family restaurant the hero had already lost both of his parents so like he's really close with both of her parents and um so there's a lot of messy feelings but it didn't take as long because it's a short book for them to figure things out because yeah i really like the discussions of food in this one it's a pancake place is the business and like they like figure out new syrups and jams to put on the pancakes it's really cute so those are all the books from april that i hadn't told you about yet i had a really good time and i'm glad that i was prompted to read more um disability rep this month uh thanks to the readathon but yeah if you have any recommendations i'm always happy to pick up another disability book i've read helen huang's book a lot of telly hibbert's book and disability visibility and um the pretty one so especially if you have any other um recommendations for own voices disability representation by BIPOC people that would be especially helpful because especially in this last week of looking for disability rep I was mostly finding a lot of stuff by white people so that would be helpful thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video bye